start today with a quiz. So for today's quiz, which will be the last quiz of the term, I would like you to explain the term text painting or word painting. Okay, so we'll revisit the meaning of text painting in a moment. Today's lecture is going to be about 16th century madrigals. So we'll begin with some definitions, then we'll look at some examples and discuss approaches to analysis, and finally we're going to contemplate the question of origin. Where do madrigals come from? First, definitions. The word madrigal describes both a poetic form and a musical form. In poetry, the word madrigal describes a text that typically has one stanza comprised of 11 to 12 lines. And these lines will be some combination of seven syllable lines and 11 syllable lines, often with no regular rhyme scheme though we do tend to find a couplet at the very end. So here on the slide, I've given you an example of a madrigal that is a poetic form. So you'll see you have a seven syllable line, 11 syllable line, seven, seven, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, seven, 11, 11. And it ends with a couplet as we expect. This is actually a madrigal that was set by the composer Rory. So this is one that received musical treatment. So that's the poetic term. That's a very, very narrow definition of a madrigal. It also describes a musical genre. And this is a pretty straightforward definition. A madrigal in music is basically a setting of a poetic text that has a high literary quality. And the text can be any form. So the text might be a sonnet, the text might be a madrigal, the text might be a ballad, the text might be a sestino, where you have six stanzas and each stanza is six lines. So there's no formula for what the text should look like. Musically, the form is what we describe as being through composed. So what do you think that means? What does it mean for a work to be through composed, the term through composition? What does that word describe? They don't reuse material. Yeah, that's, that's, that's one way to, to put it. So a continuous form where there isn't any sort of repetition. And it's nice to think about through composition as being uh, in contrast to strophic forms. So with a strophic form, uh, for example, Songs of the Troubadours, you'll have, let's say, four stanzas of text, and each stanza will be set with the same music. Uh, in a through-composed composition, you might have four stanzas of text, and each stanza will be set with different music. So there's no repeated information, no repeated material. And one very significant feature of the madrigal is that composers are interested in this direct communication of textual meaning. And we'll take a look at how this works in some examples. So we're going to look at three examples from different <coughs> madrigal periods. And we tend to divide the madrigals into an early period, a middle period, and a late period. The early period lasting roughly from 1530 to 1550, middle period 1550 to 1570, and the late period from 1570 until the early 17th century, early 1600s. Right, so we'll begin on page 330 of your anthologies. Page 330. Right. So, this is a madrigal by Arpadel. It's the madrigal by Arcadel, you know, okay. so um, El Bianco e Dolce Cigno. Okay. All right, page 330 for everyone else. I think we'll just start by listening to this, and then we can talk about its features.
Now, musically, this piece exemplifies in many ways what we consider to be the early madrigal style. So you'll notice that textures predominantly homophonic, syllabic text setting, um, you have very limited harmonic adventure. There's a few colorful chords, but nothing really striking. And of course, clear cadences throughout. You can hear where musical phrases end, and these often align with poetic verses or with sentences, so syntactic structures. But even with this, this kind of relatively simplistic musical style, we do find that Arkadel's interested in conveying the meaning of the text. So let's look at the text now on page 332. Um, and Renjin, I'll have you read this one, The White and Sweet Swan. Uh, the White and Sweet Swan, by singing and I, weeping, come to the end of my life. Strange and different faith that it dies this, uh, this consolate, mm -hmm. and I die happy. A death that may die fills me to be with joy and desire. If when I die, no other pain and fear, when I would die, uh, death a day, I would be content. Okay, so on the surface, this is a text about death and dying. So in what way does Arc Adult communicate that meaning, the, the imagery of, of death. So looking to the music, how does he describe the sense of, of death or falling? at the phrase, at the end of my life. So find where that phrase begins. Al fin del vivel mio. Jenny, do you want to tell us? Yeah, the melodic Yeah, you have these descending melodic gestures. And you, you get a lot of that throughout this piece, where death is conveyed with a melodic descent. And we call this text pink. So this has, this has a very precise meaning. This is not just good old-fashioned text expression. When we use the word text painting or word painting, we're talking about a specific kind of musical device in which the music evokes or depicts the literal meaning of the text. So an ascending melody on the word to fly, or a descending melody on the words death and dying. So text painting or word painting. Now the thing about this madrigal is that the text is not really about dying, is it? So I want to say just quickly a little bit about the context of these madrigals. So these early madrigals from uh, 1530s, 40s, 50s, uh, they would have been performed by aristocrats in social groups, small settings, one to a part, typically for the sake of the performer. So they weren't necessarily performing for audiences unless it was academy, an academy setting. But these were, these were small aristocratic social gatherings. And I, I suggested that today you read an article, it was optional, by Laura Macy. And what she tells us is that the madrigal, because it was this social activity, these gatherings and in intimate settings, it provided a forum, a kind of arena, for safe conversation about sex. So with that in mind then, what does this text really mean? And I'm going to pick on you, Morgan, to pick up from on this. Tell us a little bit about the specific um, meaning of this text. Um, death is one of the most common uh, double meanings you're going to see in magicals. And so it's like the, the climax, like the orgasm. And so yes. Right. So death here, the little death dying, is an innuendo. It refers to sexual climax, orgasm. And this poem then is kind of building up tension, alluding to the act of death, talking about the white swan, wink, wink. But at the very end, you get this kind of little playful nudge, like, oh, well, I'd be happy to die a thousand times a day. 
So it ends, after building up the sexual tension, it ends with a kind of witty, clever joke. Um, so you can imagine sitting among your aristocratic friends, singing through these madrigals and coming to the joke at the end. Good, so that's an example of our early madrigal. Now we're going to delve deeper into mid-century and late-century madrigals, which get quite exciting and lurid. So an important character in the mid-century madrigal is a fellow named Nicola Vicentino. He is an Italian theorist and composer, and he's interested in harmonic experimentation. And the way that he does this is he applies Greek theories, so theories about Greek music, to 16th century practices. Specifically, he envisions a system of three tetrachords or three genera. The, the diatonic, the chromatic, and the inharmonic. And I'm not going to ask you to memorize these, but I, I kind of want you to be aware of how we, we can conceptualize his theories. So, treble clef. These would be the pitches in your diatonic tetrachord. That would be your chromatic tetrachord. And your inharmonic tetrachord is, is a little bit tricky. Uh, he suggests that there's something of a microtuning going on. So this F would be a quarter tone low. Now what Vicentino argues is that you can find these four tetrachords in basically any vocal music, that you can use these as the basis for analysis of vocal music. Now unfortunately Vicentino, he's kind of regarded as a cranky old crazy man during his lifetime. And he was the object of ridicule in the 1550s. He engaged in a public debate with this Portuguese music theorist who stated uh, that Vicentino, that the system of three tetrachords was essentially useless. And what happens is a group of singers in Rome at the papal court they get together and they decide to sign an official document that states that Vicentino is in fact wrong and he is inaccurate. So he's, he's the this, this subject of kind of laughter and, and mockery. But what's significant here though about these, these three tetrachords, uh, this experiment with microtuning pervasive chromaticism, is that it's going to help us to extend the expressive possibilities of harmony in the mid-16th century and in the late 16th century. So this theoretical idea helps us to extend the expressive possibilities of harmony. And we see that in these mid and late century magicals. I want to, however, though, give you a couple more specific tools and ways to think about harmony and pitch in madrigals. The first is chromaticism. And here, this word chromaticism means something more specific than I think the way you're used to thinking about it. Chromaticism in the 16th and 17th century describes melodic intervals of the same name in which one is chromatically altered. So going from G to G sharp, that would be chromaticism. Going from B to B flat would be chromaticism. Going from A to A sharp would be chromaticism. However, going from A to B flat is nothing special. That would not be considered a chromatic melodic interval. So be on the lookout for instances of chromatic movement in the melodies. That will typically be used to highlight an essential moment in the text. The second thing to be on the lookout for, chordal inversions. 
So if you encounter a passage in a madrigal where you have a whole lot of six chords or six four chords, this will often be a, a moment of instability or intensity in which the composer is trying to draw your attention to the text. And finally, and this is a significant one that requires a bit of explanation. Looking for when compositions move from flat-sided harmonies to sharp-sided harmonies. And again, this requires a little bit of explanation. So in the 16th century and also in the 17th century, so this is valuable for next semester as well, not just for today and next week. Composers had available to them two types of signatures or systems. The first one is Cantus Durus. The second one was Cantus Mollis. So we can think of these as being signatures or as being systems is another way to describe them. In Cantus Durus, you have no flats or sharps in your signature. It's an empty signature. In Cantus Mollis, you have one flat in your signature. Now beneath each signature within each system, you could locate a variety of different chords or tonal centers is another way to think about it. So I have a little chart here that explains how this works. So you see on the left, you have mollus chords. So these are the flat-sided chords. So D flat, A flat, E flat, B flat, F. These are all mollus chords. Then moving to the right, you enter a durus realm. These are sharp-sided chords. So B major, E major, A major, D. And then, of course, there are um, the minor chords that, that accompany them, the relative minors. And then there's a bit of overlap between mollus and durus systems, and you have that in the home space, uh, in which there would be no need for a flat in the key signature. So there's this neutral home space in which the mollus and the durus overlap. Now, why does this matter? What we find in madrigals, and also in 17th century opera, this is, this is a wonderful tool to have in your back pocket when you get to opera next semester. Uh, what we find is that composers are going to shift, sometimes quite abruptly, sometimes gradually, from a flat-sided tonal area to a sharp-sided tonal area, or sharp to flat, in order to heighten the textual meaning. And we'll see some specific examples of how this works in, in, in the madrigals we'll be looking at. Um, but again, when you move either abruptly or gradually from durus to mollus or mollus to durus, it's going to signal something special happening in the text, intensifying that textual meaning. Good, so the things to keep in mind, and also I guess I should add a point zero up here, word painting. So the, this is our toolbox for analyzing madrigals. Word painting, chromaticism, chordal inversions, and then flat versus sharp-sided harmonies. Good. Let's look at an example. In your anthologies, turn to the next page, uh, 334. This is a madrigal by Rore. And actually, let's start on 337, 337, where the text is. And John, can I ask you to read the text? From the fair regions of the east, clear and bright rose Venus, and I enjoyed in the arms of my divine idol the pleasure that no human mind can understand when I heard after a burning sigh, hope of my heart, sweet desire, you go, alas, alone you leave me, farewell, what will become of me gloomy and sad? Um, O oh, cruel love, much too tentative and brief are your sweet caresses. Besides, you even take delight in seeing this extreme pleasure and end in tears. Unable to say more, she held me tight, repeating her embraces in many coils, more than ever Heather or Acanthus made. 
Good. Uh, so what's what's going on in this text, John? Somebody is, well, uh, yeah, I guess like he's ascended to a point of a god figure. Eh, maybe. I mean, you, you do have that kind of uh, right. Greek imagery here, but I think we can also read this in an earthly light as well. Okay. Um, uh, Rena, do you want to help them out? What's going on in this poem? Where, where we enter first person, and I enjoyed in the arms of my divine idol the pleasure that no human mind can understand when I heard a burning sigh. It's, it, is it sexual again? Yeah. Okay, cool. <laughs> um, yes. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, you go alas, that's probably like, okay, you go alas, alone you leave me. Mm -hmm. So, like, he's gone and she's not there yet. Uh, so that's, well, he's trying to leave. He's trying... They're probably waking up after kind of a night of love making. And that's where you have Venus rising, sort of the sun rising in the backdrop, waking up in the morning. The guy's trying to get out of there, and she says, Oh, no, you can't leave. Alas, alas, alone, farewell, gloomy, sad, misery, anguish, sadness, pain. Um, that's a typical feature of a lot of these magical texts. Um, and then she wraps his arms around him. So lots of really vivid imagery here. So the question then is how does Rory communicate the meaning of the text? How does he isolate individual words? How does he suggest particular affects with musical devices? So we'll listen to this at least once and then we'll discuss it in detail. up into two large groups, medium-sized groups, and one group, group one, will be responsible for measures one through thirty. Group two will deal with measures thirty until the end. Um, so Kyle, Morgan, Rendon, um, how about the three of you are in group one, and then the remaining four, if you could be in group two. And you don't, I mean, you can work quietly and in isolation if you prefer. But make sure that you're you're responsible for measures one through thirty, and you're thirty until the end. Just in terms of like text painting. Yeah, everything. So how is how is Rory communicating textual meaning? How does he set the text in a meaningful way? Okay, let's go ahead and regroup and talk about this magical. So we'll begin with Morgan, Kyle, and Renjin. Why don't you tell us, walk us through, I think, phrase by phrase, explaining the musical features in this piece. So, okay, so um, it starts like, at the beginning it's talking about how like, the sun is rising, and like Venus is rising, and um, it's kind of like a slow fade in with each voice like slowly coming in, so it's kind of like a, like showing that. And then also when it talks about like Venus rising, you have like a ton of like ascending, um, that 16, eighth notes? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. And the... Uh, Great. So that's, I mean, that's a really good example of literal text painting, that the description of rising Venus and you have ascending melodic lines throughout. Um, and also the point about the beginning is a good one, that you have the kind of staggered, irregular entrances, uh, like a fade in. Um, the morning is approaching. OK, keep going. Uh, also, yeah, um, at the end of the second line, when it says, and I, mm -hmm. all of this is the Yeah. Nice. Uh, and then we talked about maybe there was a slight shift later on, right, at, right around the 109 mark, mm -hmm. um, from like a sort of a flat type piece of to a sharp one. But it's and not too crazy. It's, 
it's yeah, it also marks like a dramatic point where she is speaking. Yes. And uh, during that point, um, the top voice wasn't singing, and as soon as she starts speaking, the top voice comes in with most of the other voices at the same time. Yeah, that's. I think this is this is a really great point here. Measure twenty five, when the female voice speaks in the poem. This is where the soprano line enters. And also, as Kyle said, this is where you start to see more sharp harmonies, so intensifying music there. OK, good. Any other, any other observations? OK. Um, I mean, you could point on me in measure 29, I just see this, uh, the word sweet desire. Harmonically, what happens there? So you have a lot of sharp harmonies, um, and then you have kind of like a harmonic surprise, this moment of harmonic coloration. What, it, what is it, Morgan? Is that, is that you're talking about the flat and the low? Yeah, notes? yeah, you have that, right, the E-flat triad there. Great, okay, let's, well, let's listen to the beginning now, with all of this in mind, all of these exciting musical devices. Oops. So staggered entrances, sunrise. things uh, I, I mean I don't know I thought that there was like more of a significance to harmonic change but I guess it just denotes like not even like a shift in tone but a, a, like a this is significant so pay attention yeah um, and so I think that she goes from I don't know exactly what the lines are but like what will become of me gloomy and sad and then she shifts to like oh cruel love mm -hmm. so it's like First she's worried about herself, and then she's worried about like love. So it is a shift, but it's not really like... Right, right. Yeah. But it's it's sort of this midpoint of her persuasive speech. Don't yes. go, don't go. And she's kind of just pulling out all the harmonic tools left and right <clears throat> to persuade 
her, her partner to stay. Yeah. So harmony as a persuasive device, I guess is one way to think about it. Yeah. But I, the big picture here, though, is that you have a lot of sharp-sided harmonies. You're in what you would call a Duris realm, measures 35 to 40, and a little bit before that as well. And then, bam, measure 41, you get that C minor triad, and immediately we start to see more flat-sided harmonies. It's really just a... Uh, Mm, knife in the heart kind of moment. Um, and what, what Jenny and Rena had pointed out is really interesting, that you have a Phrygian cadence that ends on A. So you expect that that A is then going to move to a D minor or a D major chord, but you get that harmonic whiplash of going to a C minor triad. That's what's really sort of astounding about this moment. And when we go through and listen to it again, you'll, you'll really hear it. It's quite visceral. Um, okay, what, what else is going on here, though, measure 35? George noticed something really cool yes. about, yeah, the Sola Milaski. Um, oh, okay. Basically, she says, leave me alone, and on the word, which we, I think translates as leave, leave, it uh, goes from, from a B flat to a B natural. Yes, yes, very good. So, chromaticism. Mm -hmm. Melodic chromaticism, going from, uh, where, what is this, measure 33? Yeah, measure 33, on yeah. the words, um, leave me, you have the B flat to the B natural. And then to follow that, it's kind of like a guy is saying like goodbye, and then she says goodbye back. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And looking at uh, the voices, how the voices are used, and anyone can jump in here, but 35, this I think goes back to Morgan's point about the soprano entering at measure 25. Um, so measure 35, what's special about this passage? There's no bass voice. There's no bass voice, mm -hmm. right. So you take away kind of the bottom masculinity of it, or at least the sense of stability taking away the lowest voice. All right, great. Let's keep going here. Um, it gets pretty flat. You get uh, to a D flat major triad, which is, that's a really nasty harmony um, in the 16th century. So we do, we get all the way to measure 40, 48, all the way to D flat major. Um, all right, other things that you guys noticed. Um, right around like the 47, 48 area, like mm -hmm. he does some more text painting like on the words like right after corte, meaning short, like he gets into some shorter rhythms. Oh yeah, there. that's good. Yeah. And then, and then dolcese, which is sweet or sweetly, perhaps, mm -hmm. like, yeah, yeah. sweet. Yeah, yeah. It starts to hold it a bit. Yeah, I, I think that's good. Right, and that's also, of course, the moment with, where you have the D-flat harmony as well. Um, good, I like that. Um, anything else? It's kind of jumping forward, but mm -hmm. on the last line, of the past more than ever, I have ever, and I think just made, mm -hmm. um, if you look at the last page, it's measure 68-ish. Um, that line is repeated multiple times, so more than, yeah. than, more than ever. So then you kind of get the fact that it's more, but having it repeated multiple times. Right, and also um, you do have the word repeating her embraces, right? The idea of, of these coiling braces, like the plants themselves. So the text repetition, I think you're, you're onto something there. The text repetition kind of it overemphasizes the idea that the embraces are in fact repetitive, redundant, excessive. Any other observations about this one, John? Um, John pointed out some of the gender play, mm -hmm. which you can see, and just like at the beginning, it starts in the tenor voice, which is something I thought about adding on to when Morgan and John Barry Kiowa were talking about at the very beginning. So you're kind of getting the narrator perspective right away. Mm -hmm. um, and then, I don't know that the Ciprinia is, a, is a, just an echo of the composer's name, because it's a, Ciprinia means this Venus, and like, Cyprus was another word for Venus, spelled with an I, and I don't yeah. know, and he, he was, he wasn't really Italian. I don't, I'm, not, I'm not sure how he <laughs> took the name Cipriano, I mean, he was Franco-Flemish, and he worked, he was yeah. active in Italy, sort of like the Jascan generation. So I don't know if that that's just kind of a little add like a little autobiographical moment that he's stuck in there. But. Maybe, because well we don't know who the author of the poem is, and we have to assume that the mm. text came before the mu music. 
Yeah. So if this or, is if he's sending like a 14th century text, maybe that's why text, he chose then the text maybe then, yeah. maybe yeah. That's interesting though. That is a, that's an interesting observation. Um, so John is talking about the second poetic verse where you have clear and bright rose Venus and Chabrinha and Cipriano de Rore, if maybe there's some kind of autobiographical play. Maybe, mm. I don't know. Well, let's listen to the rest of this. Um, keeping in mind the shift from that sharp realm into the flat realm is really just striking. So here we are, we'll start, this is around measure 25, where we left off. Oh no, I'm sorry, around measure 30, where we left off. <laughs> personalities or characters in Western music history. He, he married his cousin, unhappily, and in 1590 he caught his cousin, his wife, in bed with another man. So what does Jeswaldo do? Well, he orders the murder of his wife and her lover. And this, this double assassination, especially of, of aristocrats, because he was a prince, um, and these are sort of the, the higher echelons of society. Um, this double assassination makes him a figure of, of notoriety. He's a notorious character during this time, not just later in music history textbooks, but even in the 16th and early 17th century. Um, he does remarry. He, he marries um, a princess in Ferrara. Uh, not terribly happy together. He grows increasingly melancholy. 
he develops this kind of morbid, weird, psychotic fascination with one of his uncles. And then he eventually retires into the countryside. He isolates himself completely from society. And the only place during his, most of his life that he finds solace is in music. So we're going to listen to some of his bizarre, murderous um, music, which one of his contemporaries said had attitude. And it actually, it has a lot of attitude. Uh, so let's start with the text here. In the analysis of madrigals, it's good to always start with the text and make sure you understand the text in detail and then move on to the music. So Kyle, why don't you read this one for us? I depart, I said no more. This is 357. Yeah. I depart, I said no more, the brief run of my heart's life. Then Chloe broke out in tears and said, with interrupted cries of the last, hence in pain I remain. Ah, uh, may I never cease to find a way in sad laments. Dead I was, now I am alive. Or my spent spirits return to life at the sound of such pitiful, pitiful accidents. So what's going on in this text, Kyle? Uh, well, I can only assume it's sexual. Yes, <laughs> that's a good assumption. So, I depart, io parto. So, the narrative voice is leaving. Where is he leaving from? Leaving from life. Perhaps. Um, or death into life, uh, and then back to death. Uh, so, Chlori, he's leaving the, the bedside of Chlori. And what does she do? Chlori broke out in tears and said, alas, Hence, in pain I remain, ah, may I never cease to pine away in settlement. So she's brokenhearted. This is very similar to the previous magical text that we looked at, where the fellow is trying to get out of the bedroom and the woman just loses it. She breaks down. What's peculiar is the last two lines of this text. Morgan, do you have a sense of this? You've looked at a lot of magical text. Dead I was, now I am alive, for my spent spirit returned to life. Um, okay, so... So spirit has a lot to do um, with sex as well because um, ejaculation is basically like the release of like spirit, and so he spent his spirit. Yeah. And now he's like coming back alive to maybe like go back and revisit her. <laughs> yes. Yes. Well put. Um, with with all sorts of euphemism in there. So yeah, she's he's he's remembering that he has died previously, maybe the night before, and that he is now returning to life because, returning to life, in scare quotes notably, because of the sound of such pitiful accents. So the lamentations of his lover are basically arousing him on his way out the door. And he's like, hmm, maybe I'll stick around. So it's, it's kind of a strange, peculiar text, honestly. Let's see what Gesualdo does with this. So again, looking for all of these features, word painting, chromaticism, especially in these late century madrigals, and especially in Jez Walter's works, um, and flat sharp side, rich, interesting harmonies. talking about the spent spirits and you have these these jaunty quick descending motives okay what else Jenny um this is like 
Yeah, you have sort of syncopated rhythms yeah. there, right? And that's yeah, like the word like, vivo, I live. Yeah, 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 right. Rhythmically something, it's, it's a bit more active there. And then that takes us into the spent spirits, um, measure 34, 35, 36. Okay, what else? Rina? Um, measure 59, this more, more to three. Oh, you have, wait, where? Mm -hmm. no, sorry, 20, 20, I was looking at a different number. Oh, okay, yeah. 28, um, and it says dead eye was. Um, yeah. The notes are more slower moving, like the top notes. Mm -hmm. um, so it just gives the effect that it's dead, essentially, that it's just slow moving. Yeah, yeah, so longer rhythms, and you have some descending motives there as well. So, I was dead. What happens before that? Around measure 26, 27. It's from sharp to flat. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. You have the, the A major triad, which then leads into um, an E flat triad. Um, and an A flat triad there. Yeah, so moving from the sharp to the flat. What else was really, I, look at the relationship between the soprano and the lowest voice, your bass voice, especially 26 going to 27. Intervolically, what do you have there? Extend the tap step. Yeah, yes. So you have that, that, that rich dissonance. And I hope that it jumped out to you. We'll listen to this again. Um, but that's that's a striking, striking moment to have not just a dissonance, but to have one that's extended over that period of time. And what are the words there? Is that has something to do with pain? Yeah, sad laments. Good. What else? What else about this? We're, we're hitting a lot of interesting points. John. I mean, there were just a lot of chromaticisms yes. that like didn't work for me. Like, I, I heard them and I was like, that doesn't even sound like real music. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> okay. I mean, like, come on. But, I mean, I mean, that's, that's, I, I don't know. Because it kind of, like, in a weird way sounded like he wasn't trying and it kind of felt like that was reflected in, like, the words of the music was like, oh, I'm going to just leave and I don't care. Hmm in an interesting way. Okay, can you say a little bit more specifically about the music? Um, so like, a lot of the harmonies are not necessarily agreeing, which means like, if he's talking about himself as a composer, like in the piece, then it's kind of like he's kind of like out the door already, like, I'm just gonna write this and it doesn't matter, but in terms of like the actual music, it also could reflect like, a dissonance between what he wants and what his lover wants, which is like another way, I guess, of looking at it. I don't know. Okay. Does anyone else does anyone else hear that or disagree or agree with that? That maybe the music there's something mm, incomplete about it. Is that what you're hearing? As though he, the composer himself, has one foot out the door, like the lover. Is it's not even like incomplete. It's just like there was like, I, I don't know. Yeah, I guess. Because I, I think you can. Good. Well, I mean, I wonder if anyone else has a reaction to that. George, do you have a thought about that? Like, do you mean like people throwing darts at paint balloons, sort of type thing? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> kind of like I'm gonna just throw a G sharp here because it's a G sharp, <laughs> and we haven't had enough of those in this piece. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think that's interesting, and sort of like the non-directional nature of some of the yeah, harmonies. Yeah. And that the chromaticism seems almost gratuitous at times. Yeah. Is, that, is that what you're getting yeah, it's, at? It's, yeah, it's a little much. Yeah, okay. Little... Okay. Anyone disagree with that? Okay. Okay. All right. So we're, we're all in agreement. There is something peculiar about this, though. I also think the texture, the way he uses texture is, is interesting. Um, that you have these moments of sort of sparse textures which just kind of fade away 
they don't develop into anything. And being is right. sort of not even so. Yeah, Did you was, hear that as well? Yeah, I was maybe I'm looking at a different part of you, but um, mm -hmm. the first couple of measures, when it's just being tried to, as a part, there's mm -hmm. a breast and all the voices after that, so there's a little that they're declining. And then after that, it says, I said no more, one of the voices drops out, so then it sounds like one of the voices, like no one's saying anything. And then yeah. after that, that's for grief, and then they're grieving, and then like it's only top three voices, and then like the top, the bottom two disappears. Mm -hmm. So you see the texture then as really enhancing the meaning of the text, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Okay. This is, I mean, this is very interesting. Um, I feel as though we're, we're treating Joswalda very critically here, as though he's one of our own contemporaries. <laughs> like, how dare he be in the Norton Anthology? Uh, so this is, this is good. I do want to go back, though, to the point about chromaticism, because that, I think, is a key feature of Joswalda's music and some of the music of his contemporaries, that you do have an excess of chromaticism, which I think... John, what you're hearing at times as being kind of unnecessary is to the is to the point where it's so extreme that it, it feels thoughtless. Yeah. Um, okay. Do you want to listen to this again? Yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm trying. Okay. I'm gonna try and like look for specific parts. Right okay. Now. Okay. Let's listen again. Mm -hmm. Just the baseline from 20, <laughs> 20 to 21, like what is that? Why are you doing that with your life? Um, F sharp, F natural, and then E flat, and then C. It doesn't really she's like... She's saying she's in pain. Yeah, I, it's gonna I, but I mean, it, yeah, I guess, <laughs> I guess. Yeah. Um, okay, well we can we can return to um, Jez Walder and making value judgments maybe on Monday. But I, I do need to say a little bit about the historical origins of the madrigal. Um, the madrigal is one of these genres, like most genres, that has a very complicated origin story, a very complicated history. So I wanted to address just a few of the possible, possible precedents to the madrigal, since the madrigal becomes really one of the most significant genres of the 16th century. So where does it, where does it all begin? Where does the magical come from? So one theory which was popular for a time, which we don't really accept anymore, is that the madrigal came from Italian secular vernacular popular song, specifically the frottola. So let's look at an example of a frottola as being one of the possible precedents for the madrigal. Page three, 325 in your anthologies, page 325. And Rina, you don't have this one in your anthology, but you can just listen. So page 325, this is a frottola by Marchetto Cara. And let's look at the text just quickly. So the text on page 326. Very straightforward, formulaic text. You have a refrain that alternates with a stanza. The stanza is rhyming. Every line has eight syllables. So very direct, simple, textual, poetic design. Let's then listen to the music. <laughs> Homophonic, 
uh, melodic, very memorable, uh, straightforward, direct music. In a way, you can see how this looks forward to someone like Arc Adult, right? Arc Adult's madrigal, also homophonic, predominantly syllabic. And that's what scholars used to argue, that composers took the frottola in genres similar to the frottola, and they transformed them into the more sophisticated, advanced madrigal. I should say that this is no longer a popular theory, um, because the frottola was primarily cultivated in Ferrara and Mantua, and the first madrigals were written in Florence. So we're talking about two different geographical locations. Uh, so it just doesn't make sense that frottola composers then would have started to compose madrigals. Um, so this is not a terribly popular theory anymore, even though this is what we teach at Eastman. So it's still, it's still something we talk about. Uh, so you get the inside scoop. Um, the other theory, scholars trace the madrigal back to the motet. And the reason for this is because the motet has some of the same features that the madrigal does. So motets, how would you describe them formally? Are motets strophic compositions or? Kyle, how would you describe the form of a motet, any motet we've looked at? So Qualm Pulcher S, um, Ave Maria Virgo Serena by Josquin. Uh, multiple voices. Form, uh, like the design, is it an A, A, B form, is it a strophic form, is it a, what was the word we just talked about today? Anyone? Any? Yeah, through composed. So motets are typically through composed. And in motets we do find a certain amount of expressive text setting and even word painting. So if you remember in Ave Maria and Joscan's motet, uh, if you want to flip back to page 235, just quickly, if you have your anthology <coughs> in front of you, on page 235 in Joscan's Ave Maria Virgo Serena, we know this work well. Remember that measure 21, 22, 23, you have the words full of solemn joy, full, full of solemn joy. What does he do there? He sets all of the voices homophonically. This is the first time all voices come in together to express the word full, full of solemn joy. So text expression, we do find this in the motet and motets are through composed. So the motet actually seems like a likely precedent to the magical. And this is, this is, a, this is an accepted theory. However, kind of the larger question though is, why are composers in the 16th century suddenly so intensely interested in this hyper-expressivity of the text? Why do they start to do things like word painting in much more frequently? And this has to do with someone named Petrarch. Francesco Petrarch, he's an Italian poet and a humanist. He's born in Italy in Arezzo, but he's raised in southern France in Avignon. He wrote poetry and prose in Latin, but more importantly in Italian. And one of, one of the sources of inspiration for Petrarch was this lady, this anonymous woman named Laura. Uh, he dedicated two decades of his life to writing sonnets about Laura. And unhappily, Laura rejected his advances. So Petrarch really, he kind of lived out the courtly love experience, desiring the unattainable woman. Um, why this matters? In the early 16th century, a scholar poet named Pietro Bembo, Bembo, this is a term for the exam, Pietro Bembo, he launches this, this project to revive the poetry of Petrarch. And that's because Bembo's trying to make an argument about the, the legitimacy, the sophistication of the Italian Tuscan dialect. So he points to Petrarch, he points to Dante as models, as P 
people who have written poetry in the Italian language and why this is a viable literary language. So, Bembo does something. He very closely analyzes the sonic effects of Petrarch's poetry. And he identifies these two expressive poles, gravita and piacevolezza. This means majesty or solemnity, seriousness, loftiness. And Petrarch, or Bembo says that words with strong double consonants or with the vowel sound A and O are going to have this quality of, of gravita. He also says on the opposite pole, there's this quality of piacevolezza, of sweetness. And he says that liquid consonants or the vowel sounds I, E, and U create that sense of sweetness. So he would go through and he could analyze a poem identifying affects with these two expressive qualities. Now why does this matter to madrigals? Well, what we think is that composers were perhaps influenced by Bembo's thinking, by Petrarch's poetry, and they then sought to match these sonic effects that were believed to be present in the poetry, to match them with expressive musical devices. So this hyper-analysis of the poetic text that is translated into things like word painting, rich harmonies, um, and so on. And that's how you get to the magical. All right, uh, let's take a break. I'm sorry we've gone quite a bit here, but let's take a break until uh, just before half past, and then we'll talk about the exam, which is one week from today. <laughs>